Professor Borland, thank you so much for, for your time. It's a pleasure. Could you please be briefly explain the solution you adopted for stabilizing the Pisa Tower? Yeah, um, I can give it to you in five minutes or five hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, the tower is on extremely soft material and it's about to fall over. Um, and there have been lots of solutions proposed which involve driving piles or um, uh, grouting, jacking, um, but all of them would have caused the tower to fall over because it's on the point of falling over and the ground is so soft. And eventually, and it took us, the whole job took about 12 years, um, we decided the best solution was to try and reduce its inclination without touching it. And the solution that we came up to actually I arrived at because I was consulting on the London Underground and there there's the problem of subsidence above tunnels going beneath buildings. And I, I had this initial thought, well maybe we could drive a tunnel towards the Pisa Tower and cause the ground on the high side, that's the north side, to subside a little. And of course that was and the thought of driving a tunnel in Pisa is, is rubbish, but so that was laughed at. And then and then I thought, well why not a lot of little tunnels? And eventually we came up um, with this the idea of simply drilling in with with a 150 millimeter diameter drill on the high side just outside or just beneath the high side of the foundations and extracting small quantities of soil, small amount at a time, just maybe 20, 30 litres at a time, very small amounts. And uh, we then did some model tests and it worked. I had a student here doing some model tests and uh, then we did some numerical analysis with David Potts and that worked. So uh, I managed to persuade the Pisa Commission to agree to trying just a small intervention on the tower itself. We had to be very, very careful and that worked. So we ended up doing that, drilling a lot of holes over a period of two years, taking out very small quantities of ground just a couple of metres below the north edge of the tower, just outside, just inside it. Very, very slowly, we brought the tower back from five and a half degrees to five degrees, and that was enough. It's now stable. We did a few other things, but that was the main, that was the main thing we did. So it was a, it was a solution which was essential because it's a, very valuable monument and you mustn't change its character at all. So it was a solution which didn't involve even touching, didn't touch the tower at all, and didn't change its character. And half a degree is too small to see, so it just looks as it did. So that, that was the solution, very quickly. But if you want an hour on it or more, you can do that. What would you say was the most difficult talent you have to overcome during this project? Okay, the Italian bureaucracy. <laughs> very difficult. Very, the bureaucracy in Italy is very complex. And every winter Italian will say, oh, Italian bureaucracy, it's a nightmare. And it was dealing with various uh, rules from Rome, various bureaucratic requirements. It, and. Uh, then we had a problem, which I think I spoke about, every three months, the, the decree, the law, which established us, was not renewed. So we were then vulnerable to criticism and the politicians could come in again. So it was really the bureaucracy and the politics was probably the most challenging. And the so it wasn't technical? No, the technical challenge was huge, but the the bureaucratic challenge was even larger. <laughs> we have to learn that as engineers. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, 
That was my next question. Was it difficult to reach consensus with the structural engineering team? Um, yes, in some ways. Um, the structural engineers were still thinking of the ground as a series of springs. And of course, very soft soil is nothing like a series of springs. And uh, we, did, we did have some problems um, early on, actually with one or two of the structural engineers who couldn't understand why we just couldn't put great big loads on the north side and, 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 and when they did calculations they always had springs under the tower and I said, sorry, it's, it's not, <laughs> they're not springs, <laughs> they're very soft soil. So we, we did have some problems, but we ended up good friends, but it was difficult. During the investigation, were you able to determine in how many years the tower would have been collapsed if nothing were had been done? Uh, we knew actually that it could have gone at any time. The problem was um, it would probably, if it was going to collapse, it would be due to an earthquake or maybe a gale blowing in the wrong direction. Some small uh, weather change um, and that's totally unpredictable. So, what we said was, any time between now and four years, it could go. But we, can, we can't tell you exactly when, because it wasn't a steady state motion. It was dependent on, on the weather and the climate, temperature and all sorts of things. And earthquakes and so on. So. Well, this project was obviously very important and it was a success. A success, sorry. Yeah, it was a success. It, if it had eventually failed, meaning the destruction of the tower during the project, yeah. the consequences for your career will have been catastrophic. catastrophic. Now I'd have been <laughs> famous. I'd be really famous. <laughs> How did you manage the pressure of working on such a big project and having such a big responsibility? Was it difficult emotionally, for example, at, at times, some point? At times it was difficult. Uh, I had a very supportive wife, who was very strong for me. Sadly, she died about three years ago, so that's a shame. But, um, you know, it had its, it was, I, I didn't lose sleep a lot, but occasionally I definitely did. There were times when we were very, very concerned. Yeah. I want to I did, right at the start, I should tell you this. Yeah, right of course, the, please. Right at the start, I asked the question, um, what's the, what, what are we insured for? What happens if something goes wrong? Are we covered by insurance? And no, no insurance wants and, to and they cover said, that. We will find out. I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it cannot be covered by any insurance, I'm <laughs> no, guessing. Absolutely. I, I want to ask you something about numerical models, yeah. which are they were used during the stabilization of the tower. Yes. We chose their usefulness in very complex problem situations when they are well used. What is your opinion about the growing relevance of numerical modeling in geotechnical engineering? Do you think that it's excessive use, for example, especially by inexperienced engineers, can lead to very negative or important yeah. consequences? Yeah, it's very. It's a very good question indeed, and it worries me a lot because we could not have solved the PISA problem without very powerful numerical models. But you have to understand what goes into them, and it's very important to validate them against known solutions, spend a lot of time making sure that they're giving sensible answers. Uh, I, I do worry particularly in the Far East when I travel there, there are too many big computer programs on the shelf, you can just buy them. And I find often when I get involved in a consulting job that some powerful program like Plaxis has been used and the people who are using it have not even had basic training in what plasticity is and all that sort of thing. And they tend to use it as a black box. And I think it has big big dangers. It's very, very important that you understand what goes into a big computer program, what the fundamental 
mechanisms and mechanics are, what the constitutive relationships are, how accurate the solution techniques are, and all that sort of thing. It's, it's, it can be very dangerous to be used blindly. Um, Professor Potts has a lovely story which I'll tell you because it's, it's very true. When he was interviewed for his chair by the rector of Imperial College, now called the President, but at that time it was called Rector, the rector turned round to David Potts and said, these wonderful programs you've developed, why aren't you just selling them and making a lot of money for Imperial College? And David Potts said, come with me to Heathrow. And the rector said, what do you mean come with you? He said, come with me to Heathrow. I want to show you. So the, the rector said, okay. So he said, okay, we get on the train. We go down to Terminal 4. Yes, said the rector, wondering what was going to be the answer. And he said, right, we're in Terminal 4 now. Parked outside is a 747, so let's go on board. And the rector said, on board the 707? The rector said, yeah, we'll go on together. Let's go to the cockpit. And then <laughs> David Potts said to the rector, OK, we're in the cockpit now. Now fly it. And the rector said, what do you mean fly it? He said, that's what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to sell to anyone a, a computer program which is just as complicated as a seven, flying a 747 and just sending it to them. <laughs> so David Pott got, got his professorship, but the rector had no answer to that one. So it's, it's unleashing a really powerful method of analysis. You have to, you have to know, what, you know what you need to do to fly it. <laughs> so that's, that's the story. That's a very good story. Very careful. But, but he got his professorship. The rector was happy with it. <laughs> Beside the PISA project, what would you say is the most interesting project you have ever had the chance to work on? Besides PISA? Yeah. Um, right. I think it probably I was the parliamentary expert witness for the planning and the construction of the Jubilee Line extension, which goes under London and out towards the west. Um, is it the west or is it the, the east? Uh, east of London. And that involved um, assessing the impact of the subsidence on buildings like the Big Ben Clock Tower and old, old very valuable ancient buildings and very modern buildings with very wealthy owners and all that sort of thing. So it, it was, um, and giving expert evidence uh, in Parliament was a very exciting, very interesting um, bit of work. It went on for about two or three years. I think that was probably one of the more challenging, but also very, very interesting because I was meeting the public. Um, a lot and under, trying to understand what they get worried about um, and also learning to explain to them quite difficult engineering in a, in a simple way and to convince them that I, I know what I'm talking about and not just blinding them with you know technical jargon and all that sort of thing. So that, that, was, that was excellent, I enjoyed that. But it was hard work. I think probably the most challenging, apart from Pisa. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> Chile has some soft soils, yeah. like in the northern area of Santiago, for example, the capital. Yes. In addition, Chile is a highly seismic country, actually the most seismic in the world. What are your apprehensions about the behavior of soft soils in highly seismic zones? Okay. I mean, I'm not a, an earthquake engineer, so I, I'm not really very, I'm not really the right person to ask that. Um, and of course we have a very strong earthquake engineering group at Imperial College. Um, but I, I understand, for example, that you work also in Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico City, right? Yes, yes I did. Which is actually not, on earth, not on earthquake problems, but yes, I, I did, and I have some very good friends there um, as well. But um, 
I mean, I, I think honestly, my lay not, my knowledge about earthquake engineering is not is far from far from expert, and, and I do understand you know the problems in uh, in these very very soft soils, um, and this interacts this business of the natural frequency of the building versus the frequency of the seismic shocks and all that sort of thing, but. Um, not much more than that, but I do believe that the Mexicans, and I'm sure you in Chile as well, have you know very as, as expert knowledge as good as anybody's on it actually, because you have to live with it. So I, I, I respect that completely. That's a political answer, I'm afraid, <laughs> but I'm not an expert in earthquake. Engineering. No, thank you so much. That's okay. <laughs> and is there any specific area of the technical engineering? <clears throat> where you think more research is still extremely necessary, and if so, which one? Yeah, I tell you, I tell you what my answer always is on that one. We cannot make enough measurements. It's measuring actual behavior, and it's quite difficult because you you need to um, liaise with building owners and with or, or, uh, earth uh, you know, and construction owners with contractors, with clients. So installing instruments and, and developing them that are robust and can survive the rigors of, of site work and climate and everything else is very, very demanding. And I still think that we can never get enough measurements. Um, I, be I always believe, and, and in, in every job that I'm involved with too, I ask for it, I always ask after I've made predictions for measurements to be made, because you always learn something new. And I think that's still a big challenge that we we have, to, we should never, never hesitate to make measurements of, of the way our engineering works and our designs have performed, because you always learn. They never perform, you can never predict precisely. There's a very famous saying, which I think I gave you after the lecture. It was by Hugh Golder. By who, sorry? Hugh Golder. And his, um, what he said was that any design which relies for its success on a precise calculation is a bad design. Um, designs, there's so much uncertainty in nature in the ground, working in civil engineering projects, um, that we have to design for robust behavior rather than precise, relying on a precise calculation. And there's, there's a lot of truth in that one. Um, so uh, uh, design that relies for its success on a precise calculation is a bad design. What we're looking for is robust designs that, that can tolerate uncertain behavior. So that's something I believe in very strongly. So when people go away and do very sophisticated calculations, that's okay unless you believe them. You really need to bracket the, the range of possible behavior in a very wise and realistic way. Well, Chile has been having a nice pro process of professionalization of geotechnical engineering during the last year. It's a growing good. profession in Chile at the moment. Good, good. And it has led to many young people to be interested in geotech. Yes. If possible, we would like to have a message from, from you for junior geotechnical engineering, engineers. Yeah. What things are important to develop and what would be your advice for them? Uh. Well, I'm, I always say, uh, as soon as possible, get on site. Don't just stay in the office. Always, if you can, always visit the site because uh, and look at what's going on. There all, there's lots of often uncertainties which can might be important, which don't come out if you just sit in the office. So my, one of my strong messages is, always visit the site. You're not sitting in a drawing board designing something. You must go and 
and, and if you're doing trial pits, go down the trial pits, look, look at the soil yourself, examine it, describe it properly, handle it. Um, and that's where the big lessons are. Uh, the people who just sit in a drawing office and do calculations are not getting a good view of the real world at all. So that's my big message always. And of course, make measurements of how it actually behaves. And th these keep the subject alive, keep it really dynamic. It's, it's very different from structural engineering. It's a very, very different type of engineering. Far less certain, far less... Because you can't control your materials. You know, they're, they're there, you've got to find out what their properties are. It's totally different from structural engineering. To, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Time. It's a great pleasure. I'll give you.